Hello and welcome back and that's right today I want to do a follow up to a video that I did early this year on the subject of dumb questions about NAS that aren't actually that dumb and loads of questions came off the back of that video so much so that although this is going to be the second video I reckon there's going to be a third and fourth video in this series so in this video I'm going to go through 10 more dumb questions about NAS that aren't actually that dumb but a few disclaimers straight off the bat number one you're probably going to hear lots of building work going on behind me that's beyond my control unfortunately that is going to be going on for a few of my videos in the near future so I apologize for that in advance the second thing if you are still on the fence about buying the right NAS solution for yourself then head over to the right hand side of the page over on NAS compares and test out Ed's new NAS builder tool it's currently in development if you need to get in with a password it's the word seagull and from here you can enter in so much information about the right NAS solution for you with regard to the number of bays the amount of storage the redundancy your budget how you want to use it SSD cache number of users network speeds internal speeds the lot and it will help you calculate and work out the right NAS solution for your needs just randomly clicking things here and it will spit out all of the NAS solutions that will suit your needs try it out on top of that if you want to get the right amount of storage for your needs we're going to come back to this tool later on this will allow you to pick out the right hard drives at the right price for your capacity and redundancy. And finally, of course, there's the free advice section over on NAS Compares to get support from us. But let's crack on with the first dumb question that isn't actually that dumb. Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? It's a bloody good question. Ever since Synology in the last two, two and a half years has started rolling out their solutions with slightly more curated compatibility on hard drives and SSDs, there's a lot of users that are worried about if they go for one of their solutions and use third-party drives, whether they are going to fall foul of their support and warranty services there. Now, I'll tell you straight away off the bat, in practically every case, you should be absolutely fine. It's not 100%, but mostly. Now, there are some solutions out there like this one the ds423 and again we are talking about more modern release solutions in the last couple of years where there is support of third-party drives you go to the compatibility page and you can flip between synology or third party and there's a lot of drives on there not all of them there's definitely some gaps i would say but still nonetheless lots of drives are on there and capacity only going up to 16 tb which is super annoying now if you go on to systems like in the more enterprise sector like the 1823xs plus we don't get that button for the third party drives on top of that if you do use third party drives the system will very early doors give you a little bit of a warning uh, an amber warning that says on there you are using drives that aren't on a compatibility list the system might not work in the way that you're hoping for it now we spoke to synology and a few representatives from synology on this subject in a couple of articles on the channel in the last 12 to 18 months along with a couple of videos asking them about their position on this and indeed they did soften their position when originally if people were using um, uh, non-verified drives in their Synology system the system was spitting out warnings and this was alarming people. Synology did change this in terms of its presentation on the system and they even gave us some quotes about whether people use third party drives. All of this will be linked in the description about what it means for you the end user. Now what it comes down to is they are saying that the system is capable of doing X, Y, Z in their marketing and in their promotion of these devices and the advertising of these devices based on utilizing their branded drives, the, their own hard drives and SSDs. And if you do choose to use these, drive, these systems with drives that aren't on those compatibility listings, then they're saying they can't guarantee that it will work in the way that you want it to. Although if you do use those third party drives, the system will continue to allow you to use them. It won't block them from use, but just bear in mind that they will spit out unverified warnings and also if it can be found that an inconsistency or an issue with the system on a hardware or in some cases a software level can be isolated and identified as being the result of using those third-party drives that is when it will be um, under it will come under the heading of that support not supporting you but just bear in mind that the odds of that happening are pretty substantially small and unless you're going to be going into particularly enterprise level drives uh, in hard drives and ssds inside the system you're not really going to hit much in the way of problems with regards to your support or warranty with synology just don't be surprised if when you do reach out to them utilizing those third-party drives that they may ask you to verify those drives or at least send the system without those drives included if it does need to go for a support or warranty issue Hello, IT. 
Have you tried turning it off and on again? That's right, carrying on on the subject of support. I think it is a very valid question and one that we find a lot online, not just Synology's own official forums, but also on the likes of Reddit. A lot of users, when they do buy a Synology system, they're obviously buying it to house that data for a long amount of time for themselves, family members, or business. And they want to know how long Synology or QNAP, for example, are going to maintain feature updates, maintain security updates on these systems. They all rock out the gate with hardware warranties of two to three to five years but what about that software well they do throw around the term quite a lot lifetime warranty now that lifetime isn't actually your lifetime it's more equivalent to when they use and they have changed it in recent years to lifespan the system lifespan of operation now generally when you go to their own supported web pages Synology and QNAP they do go into detail about the systems that are currently supporting the latest version of their software and if they're using legacy updates such as previous whole revisions when it stops at a given point where a system doesn't have the hardware resources to support the later revisions such as QTS 5 or DSM 7 or 7.2 but they still maintain the older versions there's actually a lot of gray between the black and white of whether a brand will support that hardware uh, sorry the uh, software in its entirety because a lot of the time they're pushing resources towards the newer full revision but generally as a rule of thumb when you go through Synology and QNAP's listings you tend to find that the support goes on for about 10 to 12 years on average so if we look at the end of life support you can see that a lot of these systems arrived from Synology in around 2009 2010 which again would be about 12 years at the time of recording this video and the same goes for QNAP but it doesn't mean that some of these devices that have been released in 2012 2013 aren't having some kind of limited issue there as you can see if you go for the limited tab there it means the chances are they can't get dsm7 the latest full version but they can get access to the previous versions such as dsm4 dsm5 and dsm6 so yes the lifespan of the software support from Synology and qnap is on average about 10 to 12 years but of course it does go down to around about seven to eight years once you start factoring in lack of support of the full updated version releases. And when DSM-8 or QTS-6 roll out the gate, presumably in the next two to three years, you will see another swathe of systems that will no longer support that, but they will support DSM-6 and 7 and QTS-4 and 5. Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? This is a point that has very much come to the forefront in the last 18 months or so. And we've seen a lot of solutions rocking out from popular NAS brands. Again, we're going to include QNAP, Terramaster, and Acer Store more than any other here because these are systems that it is actually possible to install third-party OSs on them. And although it's not an officially supported thing, you can go ahead and put both Unraid and TrueNAS quite easily on the likes of Acer Store systems, on uh, Terramaster systems, and on QNAP systems we've done articles and guides as well as videos of exactly how to install both unraid and true nas as well as utilizing things like proxmox to run dual os's on these systems but of course the big question is when you do that does that mean that the brand in question is going to completely turn their back on you well i can tell you i've spoken to so not, uh, sorry i've spoken to terramaster talk spoken to qnap and spoken to acer store and all three of them have relatively similar positions now let's focus on acer store and terramaster first they state that they although they don't officially support this they don't stop users claiming on their warranty if they go ahead and do this what they mean is if you do install unraid or TrueNAS on their systems then they won't support you in terms of how to do it they won't give you any kind of software support with regards to utilizing unraid or TrueNAS because that is not the os they include with their systems but at the same time they will still support the hardware warranty on those now with qnap it's ever so slightly different QNAP have never officially gone out of their way to say that they support endorse or will maintain the warranty of any system that has Unraid or TrueNAS or any other third-party OS installed on those systems because much like um, with the Terramaster and um, uh, Acer Store systems these arrive with a bootloader of the OS either on an MMC SSD module inside or arriving on a USB and you could accidentally delete it from there so QNAP are very reluctant to give any kind of positive uh, support of this on their platforms that said i do review a lot of their products on this channel and i've done guides on how to install proxmox unraid and true nas court and true nas scale on their systems here on the channel and i've never once received any kind of negative feedback from them on this such as them saying 
please stop doing that or, or you won't be able to get any of our review samples stuff like that that a reviewer may have when there is the give and take with any given brand and they've never said anything like that and they've never gone out of their way any of the trade shows that I've attended with either top brass or there towards the bottom when I've been reviewing or previewing their products where they've given me any kind of negative response to any of that content which only goes to I believe indicate that although they probably won't support you they're certainly not going to assuage many users in terms of utilizing that with their hardware hello IT have you tried turning it off and on again? This is a really interesting one and another subject that is coming even more important and even more in terms of vested interest current right now as we see more and more systems rocking out the gate with either hybrid hard drive and SSD storage areas or dedicated SSD storage as the primary storage of choice on these NAS systems. Now, when it comes to durability, there's no denying that SSD solid state drives aren't as durable as mechanical hard drives. It's because of the way they're used, the way um, electricity is passed through them, and most SSDs rock out the gate with something called TBW, which is terabytes written, or drive writes per day, or DWPD. These are indicators of either one, how much data you can actually store on them per year, or they're in indicators of the amount of data in terms of a, a decimal place or percentage that can be written to the drive. So in the case of many drives, SSDs, um, whether they be two and a half inch SSDs or utilized in an M.2 form, there will be slabs of uh, flash on there referred to as NAND. This is where your data lives. And higher quality NAND, generally you will find has a larger and longer period of durability. And over the years, we've seen a lot of give and take when it comes to how long SSD NAND will last as the performance of drives gets higher and higher and therefore more write actions happen to the drives. Generally, you'll find that any disk uh, SSD inside a NAS system that has a drive write per day of higher than 0 0.3 or perhaps 0 0.4 should be absolutely fine. There are SSDs that are labeled for NAS use such as WD um, Red SN700 or the um, Seagate Ironwall 525s. These have a higher rating of durability than many of their other drives, but not that much for Ultimately, you should only really be worried about the uh, durability of an SSD in your NAS, NAS system, depending on the heavy amount of write that you plan to do. Remember that figure I mentioned earlier on of drive writes per day? Well, if a, for example, if a drive has a drive write per day of 1.0 and it was a one terabyte drive, that means that you can, within the five year warranty period, be covered for full performance on this drive if you put one terabyte of data on this one terabyte of drive every single day. The odds of most domestic users doing that, or even users using cash, is tremendously small. Now again, shout out to wintelguy.com from this website. This is one of the websites I use when I want to calculate um, the drive rights per day on an SSD when all I've got is the terabytes written from the brand. And from here, you can calculate the drive rights per day. And unless you are going to be doing heavy write operations, I really don't think you need to worry about SSD durability on a NAS because ultimately if you were if you're already running this system with ssds you already have a smaller capacity and unless your recycle rate is higher than you know refilling the whole NAS system every two to three months those ssds will last an exceptionally long amount of time in your system with the added benefit that we're seeing improved raid configurations such as raid f1 and anti-wear measures being put into S um, nas software that allows ssds to be even more efficient long term then there are ssds um, SSD enabled NAS systems where they've limited the performance such as Asus Store's Flash Store series where instead of having Gen 3 times 4 lanes that would give you 3 to 4,000 megs, they've limited it to 3 times 1, which will lower the write performance on that system and overall mean those SSDs last even longer. Hello IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? This is one of those subjects that when it comes to the world of NAS, it comes a lot more from a more arcane storage place. Raid scrubbing is another 
um, a kind of measure that's built into the RAID configuration then of your NAS device when you've got multiple drives and that whole calculation of being able to withstand a drive failure. Now, standard RAID 5, which is probably one of the most popular RAID configurations, means that when data is being written to the drive at the very smallest level, data is written across the drives one by one, and then one disk is given something called parity. That is a little mathematical calculation of the data that's on the other disks. And with every way of data not just one write but actual every single bit is written across you find out that the parity is moved each time and that means that if one of these drives inside our RAID 5 array was to die you could introduce a new drive and the system would be able to rebuild that data cool right well what if there is inconsistencies because remember the system is doing this hundreds of thousands of times across those disks you need to know that there isn't an inconsistency within that raid rather than wait until you have a raid drive failure and it goes into a degraded state and introduce a new drive to find out there was an inconsistency that is what raid scrubbing does it checks for inconsistencies across the raid pool and should be done every month to every perhaps every two months there now with newer generations of nas systems that are arriving with improved software it's worth giving a shout out to things like zfs raid pools which have enhanced checksums built into them during the right operations anyway the same goes for when you're utilizing btrfs on synology systems all of which have checksums built into them that when data is being passed through not unlike ECC memory that has an extra component on board to compare the beginning and the end of data transfer going through, all of these add up to, although uh, it means that RAID scrubbing becomes less necessary, nevertheless you should schedule your RAID scrubbing for between one to three months on a regular schedule. Bear in mind it will dip the performance of your system during that operation, so try to do it during out of busy hours. Hello IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? That's a really good question. With so many users being told that you should lop in some SSDs to go with your hard drive to make everything faster, does SSD caching actually make your storage array faster? And the answer is yes and no, which I know is super annoying, okay? So let's break really down into it. Now, when it comes to read and write operations, the way data is moving back and forth onto your NAS system does differ quite wildly. In the case of write operations, when it comes to using SSD cache for writing, what happens is the data you are sending to the NAS goes to the SSDs, which are much faster in terms of um, response rate and write rate and you know within the system having the data being written, and then either automatically or during idle times, the data is then moved over to the larger, slower storage array. Now, on the other hand, you've got read caching. Read caching is when the system, rather than accessing the data on our slower hard drives, accesses it from the SSDs. But how does it know when it's the right amount of data? Well, that means it's accessing the more frequently accessed data. So what that means is, as the same data is being accessed over and over, copies of that data is moved over to the read cache area. And therefore, when that data is being retrieved, as it's more common, the system will make sure that it's being pulled from the SSD and not the slower hard drives. Unfortunately, it's worth bearing in mind that SSD caching that really only benefits much, much smaller data. Metadata, I.O. file stuff, not all the big, larger sequential data. You can tailor it in some cases, like you can with QNAP, but not all the time. So if either of those in instances sound good to you, then it might be useful for you to take advantage of caching. But bear in mind a few things. Number one, write-only cache, if you only want to take advantage of write-only cache, isn't supported on Synology system. If you want write only, you have to go for a QNAP. Also on top of that, the performance are, is incredibly you know, different from case to case basis because of the scale of data being utilized. And yes, on a QNAP, you can change the IO size so you can have much larger, blockier data to be factored into your read and write caching. But nonetheless, unless you know you're gonna be accessing large conglomerations of data that is the same very regularly from multiple sources, such as using virtual machines or containers, the benefits will change from person to person and setup to setup. However, if you do have SSDs in your system, rather than using read or read and write caching, I would recommend looking into something called tiering. And that is when the system with tiered storage takes the hard drives and takes the SSDs and merges them into a single storage pool. And rather than copying data um, internally, it actually moves the data physically. So it 
uh, tiered data takes advantage firstly of write caching so all of the write operations will go via the SSD to improve that performance but in the read caching rather than standard read caching what happens is as data is being more frequently accessed rather than the data being copied albeit temporarily to the SSDs it physically moves the data onto the SSDs so you end up with a single storage pool that comprises of a cold data area made of hard drives and you've got warm and hot data where you can introduce multiple kinds of SSD like NVMe and SATA into a single storage pool bear in mind that tiered storage is only supported on a handful of NAS platforms QNAP being one of the most prominent out there so bear in mind that you may not need to use SSD caching and I hope this has helped you understand if you do but just just know there are alternatives out there. Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Now, full disclosure, I'm going to skip over this one just a little bit because I've already made a full video on this subject already and a detailed article explaining in some scenarios which is better between having more hard drives or fewer but larger hard drives. Ultimately, the benefits can come down to as follows. If you have multiple small hard drives, the, the benefits are as follows. Number one, you can end up with normally a better price per terabyte because if you've got fewer larger drives, not only do those drives cost more because there's more data space and generally you do find that newer drives cost more but also with those larger drives you with fewer larger drives your RAID configuration such as a RAID 1 or RAID 5 ends up with the loss of data for each of those individual drives because of redundancy being substantially higher whereas when you've got multiple drives and you've got one disk of failure protection the amount of data you're losing and the amount you have to spend on the drives that you're losing towards parity and that redundancy ends up being a smaller impact also when you've got multiple drives of a smaller quantity you actually get higher performance because once you've got multiple drives being read and written to at any given time the result is that that improves the overall performance and you get larger speeds more on that later on with another question now larger capacity drives on the other hand do allow you to not spread yourself out too thin not allow too many uh, failure uh, vectors there now again depending on your setup there will be advantages and disadvantages also larger drives present generally in smaller groups a better price per terabyte only when you expand into larger groups that it leverages then towards having more drives to have a better price per terabyte again there are so many more reasons why you would find benefit in both more drives or larger drives so i recommend checking out the article linked in the description on top of that do take advantage of eddie's price per terabyte device here the tool for example you're putting i want 40 tbs i've got five bays of storage i want one disk of failure and let's say i've got four grand to play with i can calculate it there and then it will tell me the best options in terms of hard drives to get not only that capacity but how much i'll actually pay it's that straightforward at all and although we're going to look on look at glowing up and making it look a little bit nicer it is functional right now and you can find it on the right hand side of the page under nas finder hello it have you tried turning it off and on again? This is one that I have discussed in other videos, but unfortunately, because of every time I talk about it, it's within smaller videos, it never really gets as good a coverage as it should. So I just wanted to add it in today's, and that is, why is one of Synology's best features, Synology Hybrid RAID, not available on some of their bigger and more impressive systems that arguably many people would think it would benefit from. To save everyone a little bit of time, if you're not aware, Synology Hybrid RAID, unlike traditional RAIDs which require every single drive in the array to be the same capacity, Synology Hybrid RAID allows you to mix and match larger drives into the array and take advantage of the larger capacity that's been afforded to them. So for example, if you went for a 12 bay NAS and on day one you put four drives in it, a few years down the line if you want to add more drives, drives may have become cheaper you may have got a good black friday deal ultimately you may want to use larger hard drives on your existing array and that is where something like synology hybrid raid would be really really beneficial and that's why it annoys some people when shr is not available on some systems and those systems being anything with excess sa or anything that is deemed high-end business large storage capacity or data center now 
We have spoke to Synology about this, and one of the reasons they stated that they don't include um, SHR on any of their more enterprise level systems is because SHR, for all of its benefits of mix and matching drives, does not provide the same level of performance as a traditional RAID. And ultimately, there's plenty of forums where both Synology members and non Synology members have discussed this online and our articles here on NAS Compares where they have discussed why they don't include Synology Hybrid Array on their enterprise level systems and predominantly it does come down to performance not being as good as traditional RAIDs. However, do bear in mind that not only if you have an existing Synology NAS system that has an SHR that you can actually just migrate it over to a non-SHR supporting NAS, which is pretty darn cool. But also, over on GitHub, we've got a user here that's constantly making great hacks, this guy. And again, we're going to make a video on uh, 007 Revad. He's got a, um, a little hack you can use here to actually enable SHR on your Synology NAS. But just bear in mind, this is using command line and script there in the background over SSH and can lead to your system. You're digging in a little deep there. And if you're not comfortable doing that, I don't recommend using something like this. But just to let you know, there are ways to get SHR on non-SHR supported systems, both officially and unofficially. And if that is something you are desperate for on your system, there are ways and means to get it. Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? This always feels decidedly unfair, but it has to be said that whenever I talk about brands here on the channel, two brands that really get shit on a little bit too much, for my opinion, is Acer Store and Terramaster. Everyone's talking the big game about Synology and QNAP, myself included. Let's face it, I talk about those two brands way more than I do about Acer Store and Terramaster, and I think there is a consistent feeling. A lot of people think, well, those two brands must be crap, right? Reality is... They're not. It's just a question of scale. Synology and QNAP are definitely the market leaders when it comes to both home, small and large business turnkey NAS solutions. But like any industry, I think it is very, very healthy for there to be competition. And I think when it comes to buying your own NAS server, Acer Store and Terramaster do bring something to the party that is just not available elsewhere. Now, yes, Synology and QNAP, well, generally they have a more evolved software platform, but when it comes to getting some of the best hardware out there, you know, like the flash door, if you want to go for some of these tower systems from Terramaster, in terms of hardware, they are exceptionally well put together. Now, their softwares, ADM and TOS, from both brands respectively, are still very, very well put together platforms. They're just not as evolved as DSM, not quite as evolved and a feature rich as QTS. They don't have the budgets for that. Because remember, much like Synology and QNAP, these are two brands that are producing turnkey solutions, a combined hardware and software software solution there that takes up a lot of money not only have you got to get the hardware to start with but then you've got to support your software support it with updates support compatibility security and more these things take time and take money in a way that isn't as immediately visible as hardware again you can look online and if you are an existing Synology or QNAP user chances are these systems in terms of software will feel a little limited but I think it would be very unfair to refer to them as trash refer to them as terrible now to put that into a little perspective, you've got brands like Zixel out there that are rocking out solutions with, frankly, terrible warranty support behind them. On top of that, you have brands like WD that have had their own, you know, NAS family for a very long time in the MyBook, MyCloud series for the better part of 12, 15 years. And I'll tell you right now, these are not very good NAS systems. As generally, target storage, maybe, they're all right if you want a combined pre-populated solution they're affordable but there have just been way way too many issues with their platforms when it comes to the software being hacked in for auto deletion the lack of firmware so support in some places when wd servers got attacked and I do find online, it seems really aggressive that people talk smack about Acer Store and Terramaster quite a lot, but they never really talk about WD in that same way, and although they do get called out, much like QNAP and Terramaster and Acer Store were called out about Deadbolt and other ransomware attacks, and Synology with Locker, I think there is definitely a disparity across the whole NAS industry with the way a lot of these brands are perceived, when you really have to factor in and look at the size of these brands and the amount of money behind them in order to facilitate their product and their software and maybe just take a moment to look at the reviews and the online demos available to test the software from both brands before you make a decision based on you know general hearsay hello it 
Have you tried turning it off and on again? This last question is one that I hear quite a lot from people, either individuals or small office groups that don't have a system admin in-house. They've looked online, they've seen a NAS that's got 10 GBE slapped onto the back of it, and they thought, do you know what? Hey-ho, I could do with 10 GBE, 1,000 megs per second. Get in. And then they plug it, connect all the wires up, and then they get terrible performance. They're looking at it and they're going, why am I getting 435 megabytes per second? I'm connecting this over 10 GBE. Well... That is the difference between bandwidth and speed. Now, think of a tap. A tap, have you ever stayed in a terrible hotel that's got awful water pressure? It's got all of the pipes. You could have the widest pipes in the world all the way running through the wall and the ground. But the fact of the matter is, if the pressure isn't there to push the water through, it's just not going to be enough. And that is true also of 10 GBE. 10 GBE it has a lot of factors you have to bear in mind before you get that full 1000 megabytes per second. What do I mean by that? Well, one of the earliest ones is the number of drives. For example, here is the DS723 Plus from Synology, and this is their own performance stats. As you can see here, they've got 10 GBE, and they've got it rated there at 1,179 megabytes per second. They fully saturated a 10 GBE connection on this two bay NAS, but that's because it was using M2 NVMEs in order to do it. You do it with hard drives, suddenly that performance dips substantially. And that is because hard drives, you need to have several of them all calculated together. We mentioned this earlier on with RAID uh, configurations and the number of drives. You have to have more drives to reach that high performance. So if a drive, for example, has 200 megabytes per second performance, and again, we've gone back to Wintel Guy here. So for example, we've got two TB drives here. If the performance on them was rated at 220 megabytes per second, uh, we will ignore the cost for now. We've got four of them there inside the configuration. You can see that at best, at the very best, in a RAID 5 configuration, you would get 880 megs. Now, that... I would argue is very unrealistic because generally you find that the performance benefits of each drive being added to your RAID configuration for non-pro drives is around about 70 to 100 megs and for pro drives or enterprise class drives every drive you add tends to add 120 to 150 megabytes per second with each added drive within the RAID group but that means that if you don't have enough storage media inside your 10 GBE NAS you're not going to get 10 GBE performance. All you've got with 10 GBE is a big pipe, but you're not supplying enough water through it there. And another factor that can come in is the actual data itself. Now, 10 GBE, again, is a pipeline, but the complexity, think of it as the fluidity or the viscosity of the water going through that pipe. Larger sequential data and block data moves differently to if you had 60,000 files at one megabyte each. Although both of them could be exactly the same storage amount, the frequency, the volume and the consistency of the data is going to be wildly different and that can hugely impact performance. So do bear in mind with 10GBE and don't forget to look into Jumbo Frames and MTU. Again, some of the uh, articles I talked about today will be referenced below on that. But all of these add up to having a perfect 10G connection. Just buying a 10G NAS is not enough. You've got to make sure you've got a good enough CPU, good enough media inside and the right kinds of storage for saturation. And there you go. Ten dumb questions about NAS that, do you know what? They're not that dumb. I hope you've enjoyed this. We are going to do a third video on this. But to be honest with you, at this rate, there's going to be even more. So let me know your comments in the uh, below there in the video to let me know any other questions you want covered. And the more recurring questions or the more frequent questions will, of course, be the ones that we talk about there. Again, use the free advice section over on NAS Compares if you need support. Use our Discord there. You can use the Ask NAS Compares forum. Of course, use our NAS Builder if you want to find the right solution for you as well as that tb calculator and more to get the right storage drives to go inside but apart from that thank you so much for watching and have yourselves a fantastic week